So here we are on our retreat at Pamaloka exploring what is the order. And one answer to that is simply, well, it's Bhante's order. Uh, it's Bhante Sagaracha's order. It's, and he says very clearly, it's my disciples and the disciples of my disciples. So what we thought we wanted to do today is really um, focus on Bhante. So in a sense, we're going back to that first ordination vow uh, with loyalty to my teachers and um, such as such a Roger is very 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 clear about what that means. The different levels of Buddha, um, Buddha, then Bante, and then uh, your your private preceptors and Kanyamitras and so on. But Bante has a very special place in that lineage. He's really the gateway for us for the to the Buddha Dharma. So this morning I'm just going to be in conversation, as we say, <laughs> with Padmavadra. Uh, which basically means he does most of the talking and I occasionally, you know, interject <laughs> uh, um, about Bhante Sangrachita. And I want to, we'll, we'll get there as we go through, but I want to then, I would especially focus on what it means to um, be going through the, three, through the three jewels in loyalty to our teachers and especially uh, to Bhante Sangrachita. But we'll, we'll, we'll wind our way into that, I think, yeah. So I thought we'd start Padmavadra, not with uh, Bhante himself, but with Dada Rinpoche. Mm. So we've just had his um, anniversary, the death anniversary, death anniversary just yesterday. And um, I was really struck by a story you were telling us just the other day in, the meet, in our team meeting about meeting Dada Rinpoche. And I, I thought that little story exemplified so much of what we mean by lineage. <coughs> I wonder whether you sort of tell us about your meeting with Dada Rinpoche before we get to Bhante okay. Rinpoche. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Very nice to be with you here this morning and to be participating in your retreat. So unfortunately, I, I was supposed to be on the weekend and on this retreat, but as you know, I tested positive. I'm negative now. I'm very <laughs> negative. I'm so <laughs> negative. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> but um, I felt disappointed because it's obviously a fantastic retreat. I mean, just being around you and sitting last night with in the lounge with Mike Trebandu, um expounding poetry, just sort of getting this wonderfully positive masculine energy in the best sense. It was lovely. It was really, really lovely to uh, be around you. So I'm very glad to have been asked to do this. Mm. So thank you. Mm. Um, so I went to India with Lokamitra mm. in 1979, mm. 80, something like that, when Lokamitra started things. How old were you then? 20, 20, 21, mm. something like that. Mm. I, I had been working at Sakavati, doing, supposedly doing building work. Um, don't look closely at the plastering in some places. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I... I, I was very close to Lokamitra and um, he was going off to start things in, in India, in, particularly in Pune. And uh, I sort of tagged along. Um, and it was a very, very difficult period for me, although I think in some ways one of the most important periods in my life, actually mm -hmm. hugely influential, I think, on my understanding of the Dharma. Though I think I only discovered that later. And one of the attractions of going to India was to try and find Bhante's teachers and mm. in Dada Rinpoche being one of them in Kalimpong but I also managed to track down Chatra Rinpoche Chatra yeah. Songhe Dorje yeah. as well um, but uh, I mean I I you know I look back I was just so so kacha as they say in India so so raw so uncooked it's the opposite of pucker which means <laughs> cooked and mature, ripens. I was just utterly kutcher, you know, mm. um, just a kid, really. I mm. mean, a very young, early 20-year-old. So mm. going going from Pune across to Calcutta and then up to uh, New Jalpaiguri and then getting the bus up to Darjeeling and Kalimpong and, and, and so on. But I'm so grateful to have met Dada Rinpoche. I just mm. turned up at the school... Um, I had, I knew I had to, you know, that the, the etiquette was to get a white cutter, a, a silk scarf, and I went to a shop in Darjeeling and I asked for a, a his, you know, I asked for a white scarf and the man said, well, it, who's it for? 
And he said, oh, well, you want a really good one then. And, um, <laughs> and I didn't have much money. I mean, mm. very, very, very few rupees. But I did buy a decent scarf. And um, so I, I walked into the school and they immediately called Rinpoche because I uh-huh. said I was a disciple of, of, of Bante. Mm. So he immediately came uh, with Jampal Calden, his... Uh, well, his assistant and manager and headmaster of the school, and I immediately did a full-length prostration mm. and sort of offering this scarf. And Rinpoche just looked incredibly compassionate <laughs> because, you know, it was a stone floor and I was quite, you know, throwing myself down. He looked really worried that I was <laughs> you know, doing myself major damage. But, um, you know, very, very compassionate, very, very lovely, beautiful man. And I think he must have been in his... I guess his 60s then, and mm. lovely wispy moustache and beard and very simple robes. And um, I, I, we, we got into conversation. Um, he gave me time for conversation. And um, there are a number of things I remember about that, uh, about that conversation. One of them was, um, well, th- yeah, three things I remember. Um, the first one was I was so into Tibetan Buddhism mm. And uh, I wanted to know all about the differences between the different schools, you know, Nyingma, Gelu, Kagyu, Sakyapa, all the rest of it. And uh, I asked Rinpoche about the differences between the schools. And Rinpoche said, I have looked into this matter very deeply for many, many years, all being translated, of course, by Jampu Kalda, but I've looked into this matter very deeply and I've come to the conclusion that there is no essential difference <laughs> between all the schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Mm. Which is quite a statement actually mm. because there is quite a lot of sectarianism in mm. Tibetan Buddhism and Dada mm. Rinpoche of course was an incarnation of a Nyingma tulku, but uh, a line of Nyingma tulkus. but the habit of the Dalai Lamas was to, to take Nyingma tulkus and give them a Gelug education, mm. and that's what happened to him. Mm. Um, you know, he joked with Bhante, didn't he, that uh, Bhante said, well, all my teachers are Nyingma Par except for you. You're a Gelug teacher. And mm. Dada Rinpoche said, I'm secretly Nyingma Par. <laughs> <laughs> and explained his, his, his lineage. And, but I was very struck by that, mm. you know, absolute unity. And mm. he was well known for his non-sectarian attitudes. You know, he'd mm. teach Nyingma Par texts as as well as, you know, being a thoroughly Gelugpa Lama, mm. great Lama, very, very learned. And then the next thing I remember was showing him pictures of Bhante. So Bhante, when he ordained me, mm. wearing his yellow, it, it's, it's, we haven't got it on the shrine, but his yellow robes. And we've got it in the front of the house, long hair, yellow robes and a, and a, a shirt. He was wearing a very elaborate Tibetan shirt mm. when he ordained me. And... Um, and I had also, I used to carry around me t- pictures of Tara and Padmasambhava, and they, they weren't very good photographs, and I didn't look after them very well. He took them as if they were sort of sacred relics. Yeah. He immediately took hold of these photos and put them on his head, hardly yeah. touched them. And, it, and he had this habit of sort of stroking his head and going, oh, oh. <laughs> and it was completely natural. Yeah. You know, this extraordinary, yeah, incredibly learned man, I mean... One of the great geshes, you know, mm. extraordinarily learning and and you know, uh, great ability, and yet this very very simple response, simple in the best sense, immediate mm. natural devotion and wonder at, at what what I was showing him, and then uh, I asked him about his teachers, his mm. his his teachers, thinking he would mention the great Gelug teachers of his era, who were his teachers, you know, received initiation from, you know, the great lamas of, of his age, as all of these incarnate lamas did. But he didn't mention any of those. Mm. He mentioned, what was his name, Geshe Lundrup? Uh, Lundrup, Lundrup? Yeah, Geshe Lundrup, who was his tutor yeah. in, uh, in uh, was it Drepung was his monastery, this, this young man that was assigned to him. Mm. Um, and... Um, he just said he was a very simple monk, yeah. a very humble monk. And when Rinpoche talked about his teacher, just in talking about him to somebody making an inquiry, he tears welled up and he, he choked mm-hmm. as he spoke. It was very, very strong 
um, I didn't quite, quite know what to mm. say. And apparently Dada Rinpoche was very, very famous for his guru devotion. Mm. Very, very famous. And he was strict. He was a very strict teacher, you know, and as well as being like a mother and father to these young talkus. But, you know, he was, you know, very, very firm with them if they, you know, if they, if they, if they got things wrong or, you mm. know, if they were... You know, there's, there, there's a story, you know, where Rinpoche and his friends were laughing at some Nepalese pilgrims mm. in the Jokan chanting their mantras. And they were laughing because they thought they were chanting their mantras wrong. Mm. And uh, Geshe Lundra, you know, slapped, beat Dada Rinpoche and, and said, because uh, uh, that's quite common in those, in, you, you know, in those monasteries. And... Um, said, you fools, you fools, don't you realise that the pil these Nepalese pilgrims are chanting mantras properly in proper Sanskrit? We don't know how to chant properly. Um, so he said, ever since then, I've had a great appreciation of proper <laughs> Sanskrit <laughs> mantra chanting. Um, but, but yeah, there, he, he was very, very famous for his guru devotion, Dada mm. Rinpoche. Mm. And, I, and, and, you know, it's just such a different world, isn't it? I mean, mm. I, you can't... It's sort of we can't pretend to be like that, you know. Mm. That he 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 was recognised as a tulku at a very young age, came into that world, and you know he 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 was completely in that 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 world. At the same time, he did mm. Dada Rinpoche did strike his own course as well, unusually. So mm. he's he's a very interesting figure, Dada Rinpoche, because mm. on the one hand, he comes out of that very very strong guru devotion, that sense of lineage reverence you know just pouring from every pore of his body mm. and yet he was also prepared to sort of break out and go his own way particularly mm. starting that school for Tibetan refugee children and he was very critical of uh, Tibetan politicians and mm. and the sort of religio politics that that went on and he he was alienated from the Dalai Lama for many years mm. uh, not he very devoted to the Dalai Lama but he, the, the Dalai Lama's, the people around the Dalai Lama wouldn't let Rinpoche see him for a long mm. time mm. Um, because he'd been so critical of the corruption of, of Tibetan politicians. Mm. So he was a real mix in that way, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then I wanted to jump to the, the other part of the story that you told, which is Bante yes. yeah. coming here with his eye, when his eyes had gone. Yes. And because so I, I was very touched by yes, that. Yes, well, that was, that was something I remembered only the other day. I gave a mm. talk on the stupa. And, of course, Bhante did um, uh, install Rinpoche's relics in the stupa. Oh, okay. This was yeah. the first stupa of, with Rinpoche's relics. Mm, and he came here and, and, and performed that. And, um, yes, many, many, many years after that, and his eyes, sight had gone, he was staying here. And, um, and I... He wasn't in his room, so I was a bit concerned, you know, where mm. is he? Mm. So I wandered about, and there he was sitting on the bench, just inside the wall there, just looking at the stupa. And he was there for quite a long time, just sitting mm. there, just looking at the stupa, taking darshan, I, su I suspect, of his teacher, of, of mm. Dada Rinpoche. Mm. And, uh, and there was great stillness, and, you know, you, it was okay. We, we don't sort of pry into that. This is mm. Bhante communing with his, with his teacher. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I just thought just that for me was a, a wonderful evocation of what lineage really means. Mm. Mm. It's not a sort of formal thing. It's a, no. It's no. Um, what reverence even really yeah. means. It's sort of yeah. gratitude never seems enough, does it? Because you know I feel very grateful to my. Mm parents, but I'm not loyal to their teachings, mm. you know, um, mm. <laughs> heaven forfend, <laughs> I'm loyal to some of them, not always very usefully, but mm. um, let's, we'll come back to this whole question of um, reverence and, um, you know, Bhante as someone that we're loyal to when we, mm. when we take our ordination vows, but I thought we'd just carry on a bit personally and you perhaps tell us when you first met Bhante and your, your initial <laughs> impressions of Bhante when you were like 18 or something like that, um, 17, 18. Well, the first thing I, I was, with Bhante was listening to tape lectures. I mean, reel to reel as oh, well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we You're that old. Yeah. <laughs> um, when, I was train. when I was 17, when I was 17, 17, 18, uh, but we going through the Eightfold Path and 
high revolution, but it also, you know, we, we used to listen to tape lectures in those days a lot. Mm. And, uh, and uh, you know, I kind of knew immediately that Bhante was my teacher because it was, because he was Buddha Dasa's teacher. Mm. I mean, and Buddha Dasa introduced me to the Dharma very directly by leading a puja and mm. being very welcoming. And Buddha Dasa <coughs> was very devoted to to Bhante. So I kind of knew that Bhante would be my teacher even before I met him. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, I was very young, it's true, and very naive, but, but I kind of knew those mm. things. Mm. Um, and uh, I remember particularly the Tantric Path series, because I was obsessed by Tibetan Buddhism, and, but particularly the lecture, and this is before I met Bhante, I think, mm. The lecture, the the symbolism of the cosmic refuge tree and the archetypal guru, which ends with a description of the guru yoga, where you imagine yourself as Vajra Yogini, mm. with your teacher above your head yeah. and uh, Padmasambha above your teacher, Avalokiteshvara above mm. Padmasambhava, Amitabha above Avalokiteshvara, and you you recite and you know you you eventually unite with your teacher, who is the embodiment of all of the lineage of that lineage. Mm. And I thought, I am going to do this practice. <laughs> I will be doing this practice. <laughs> I just knew that I wanted to do that practice definitively. I knew it. Um, and it's interesting in that lecture because just picking up on what you said about lineage, he said mm. lineage isn't an idea. Mm. Mm. It's not just nice to know that your teacher had this teacher. Mm. It's got nothing to do with the sort of handing on of a robe or a certificate. Or mm. It's activated through devotion, mm. through faith and devotion, through Guru Yoga. You, you have that sense of the stream of, of inspiration that, that, that comes to you. Mm. And so you activate that sense of, of the stream of, of lineage, the parampara, as they call it. Um, so then there was the actual meeting with Bhante. Bhante had, was when I came along in Brighton, this was before we had a centre, and then we had a centre, a small centre. I helped out with that. I moved in with Buddha Dasa. And then we got news that Bhante was coming. He'd been in New Zealand, his first visit to New Zealand. Mm. And he'd come back to Britain and he'd heard about the centre opening in Brighton. And he was really pleased. Because mm. we, we had the, 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 this was even before we got the LBC, Sakavati. Mm. So we had a centre in Archway in North London, we called Pundarika, Banti called it Pundarika. We had a centre in Glasgow, we had a cent centre in New Zealand, mm. and activities in various places. But Brighton was, an Ariatara of course, but mm. Brighton was one of the first ever centres started outside of London. Yeah. Mm. And Banti had a long-standing connection with Brighton because mm. uh, he used to do things with the Brighton Buddhist group um, mm. and he wanted to come. So he came down. So I was tremendously excited because mm. I was going to meet my teacher, my mm. guru. Mm. And, um, you know, wow, he's coming. And inevitably there was a... It just went very flat. <laughs> you know, came in wearing a sort of grey kind of Macintosh and <laughs> sort of rather dowdy clothes and these sort of big, almost like working men's boots, very greasy hair mm. and those glasses that looked as though they had been stuck together. Mm. Um, and uh, very bad teeth, of mm. course. And um, I said, hello, you know, I was so excited. And he, you know, sort of held sort of held my hand rather limply, looked away from me and said, hello. <laughs> and, you know, I was expecting a sort of teaching. I mean, maybe I got one. Um, um, but, but so it was a very strange few days, yeah. you know, those few days. But a connection was definitely formed. Mm. Um, all sorts of different things, you know, that sort of went on there. But I remember meditating with Bhante when he came and dedicated the shrine room. Mm. And he wore his robes, he put on his robes for that. And I remember doing the Metta Bhavna, or we were doing some meditation. He seemed to be saying his, these white beads the whole time. I don't know what practice he was doing. Mm. But I remember this very strong sense of a very, something incredibly still, mm. incredibly still. Um, and, you know, you, you, you didn't move. You know, there was this profound uh, stillness. 
and we made a connection. I started to write to him and went to see him in when he was living in Norfolk before he moved here, and a connection was definitely formed. Yeah, mm. yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. And he took an interest. He wrote, you know, I'd write to him. He'd write to me. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And then perhaps let, 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 let's go from there to the experience of being ordained by Bante. Mm. Um, you were on that seminar. We've we done yeah. this interview, haven't we, for yes, the nature of yeah. mind? No, yeah. for, well, on the shepherd's search for mind. Yeah. Um, you know, what was that? What was that experience like? Being at that seminar with Bante and being ordained with Ratnaguna. Well, there's a few things I will. I mean, in some ways, Bante had. I, I, you know, pe I don't. I, people sometimes say, "Oh, you had a great friendship with Bante." No, mm. no. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't claim that. Mm. Um, Bante is my teacher. Mm. And I had the great good fortune of being around him and and in informal situations and and you know enjoying his company. But in many ways, when I look back, a lot of my encounters with Banti have been quite tough. Mm. Uh, I remember my my Mitra ceremony, which happened, you know, some months before I was ordained. In those days, when you became a Mitra, you had Kalyana Mitras. So Visantra mm. and Buddha Dasa were my Kalyana Mitras. And I remember, you know, he's, all these people from Brighton, I was the last one because I was the youngest, and I went in, and he didn't smile. Mm. You know, made the he was quite stern. And then launched into this thing about becoming a Mitra is like joining a dance. You've been on the outside of the dance. You've, you've tried out a few moves, but this is you joining the dance. Maybe one day you'll get to the centre of the dance. But it begins with action. And then he went on and on about action. Mm. He said, everything has been thought, everything has been felt, everything has been said. This is you acting. Mm. You know, and it was, you know, the <laughs> teaching was, you know, you, you know you, you, this is a real act, a real commitment in this mm. act. And, but he wasn't smiling. Mm. And afterwards, Visantra said to me, he said, he wasn't like that with anybody else. And I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he hates me. <laughs> um, but I've never forgotten that. You know, and that it's still something to, mm. to, 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 to think of. And an ordination was, was um, well, it was a mixture of things. I mean, it was a weekend retreat. Mm. With, with, I was ordained with Ratnaguna. There was a whole load of us who, who were... Who were up there from North London, I think also, I think mostly from the, the all North London Sangha, a lot of young guys. Mm. And, um, I mean, in a way, it, it, it was, again, private ordination, just very, very formal and um, very, again, very still. And um, I, I experienced it very much as a transmission of energy. Mm. You know, perhaps I would do, given the, the way I thought about things. But, you know, I definitely felt there was, a, that there was something initiatic in it, a kind of mm. energy that mm. was sort of transmitted or sparked off, I don't know how you call it, which has never stopped, mm. and which was sort of overwhelming afterwards. I mean, really sort of felt burnt by it in many ways. Um, and the public ordination, he was just so, he was so happy. I mean, he was obviously enjoying the weekend immensely. Mm. Again, robes, long hair, and this playful quality... Uh, really delighted to ordain Ratnaguna, really or delighted to ordain me, saying that when our names are mentioned, people should see lotuses unfolding and vadras descending and mm. jewels descending when they when they mention Ratnaguna's name. He was really, really happy. It was it was very hot summer in nineteen seventy six and. Mm. Uh, um, and we and the seminar, you know, I'd been on a seminar with Bhante before on the Mangala Sutta. Um, and that was incredible, you know, being with Bhante as he talked about the Buddha mm. and the Pali Canon and feeling he knows who the Buddha actually is, you know, mm. as if he's been mm. there, mm. weirdly. Um, mm. You know, something very intimate about the way Bhante talks about the Buddha. Mm. And then... The Shepherd's Search for Mind. I mean, I'd, I've never forgotten things from, from that seminar, but like I said to you, the mind stuff was a bit too mm. subtle for me, mm. I have to say. But I do remember many things in that seminar that stayed, that stayed with me. But yeah. there was also a sense of, again, something being transmitted and, 
um, you know, Bounty again just delighting mm. in Miller Rapper's communication with the young shepherd and mm. delighted to communicate that to Rat Laguna and me and the others present. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I want to just step back a minute to go back to what you said there about the initiatory feeling of Bat being ordained by Bante. Um, I remember he came up to Samagavasam and had supper with us once. He used to do a few times. And we got into this discussion about ordination because at the time we were talking a lot about the... I think Sabuti had released an article about, you know, the, the pri pri private preceptor is witnessing your game for refuge. Yeah. And Bante was really clear saying, no, no, it's more than that. Uh -huh. Uh, that, that, that that's too passive yeah. it's more than that he was saying then it was more like an initiation mm, mm. Uh, I remember it very clearly I wonder, I wonder whether you could say a bit more about well, the nation of initiation and well, Bante's part in that well it's interesting because it's Bante who had first talked about ordination as witnessing right right yeah, yeah. it was him it's not, it's not, he did start that particular mm. hair going mm. but I think it depends what you mean by witnessing mm. Um, I think there's no conflict between witnessing and initiation. Mm. I think when he means a witness in a very profound sense, mm. um, you know, bec and you know, he says, I think, in my relation to the order, that he means witnessing in the archaic judicial sense mm. that this is the truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, in other okay. words, the preceptor is sitting opposite you in the private ordination kuti, and he is not just seeing, he's sort of testifying almost, putting the seal on the fact that you are indeed effectively going for refuge. And they see that directly, mm. you know, immediately. You know, it's, it's a real seeing of that shift in your being in the, in the direction of the refugees. And I think in that, well, when you, if you're really seen and you really see your preceptor, mm. something gets activated. Mm. I think something does get activated. But I'm glad you told me that because mm. I think there is more to it. You, you need to bring more mm. in. Mm. And that is, of course, the whole transmission of the mantra. Mm. You, know, the, you know, the mantra, there's, there's something in the mantra that carries something. Mm. I don't, one doesn't want to be all sort of magical and mystical and you've got to chant it in the right way but mm. the fact that your preceptor has you know meditated on a Buddha or Bodhisattva you know for many many years that's going to inform that communication and your own feeling for the Buddha or Bodhisattva something's going to happen mm. Something's going to, it might not be immediate. You might, it might be quite quiet in the moment. A lot of people say they go ordained and it was nice and all the rest of it and wonderful and they're mm. pleased, but nothing apparently happened. But, you know, it, 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 initiation is sometimes described as planting a seed, mm. which you then have to nurture mm. uh, through uh, your spiritual practice. Mm. Yeah. But he also, I think, an, another clarification about initiation when he went into this as, as a sort of aspect of going for refuge it's it's the energizing aspect mm. that's what mm. he really wants to get at you're definitely sparked off there's an energy that's sort of invoked mm. through the act of going for refuge and that being seen by a preceptor the person you you most respect and revere mm. yeah mm. yeah is that yeah no that's really good i think yeah. it's, it feels important yeah yeah. That I want to just take. No, we're up for time. I want to um, go a bit further forward to. Actually, the first. I mean, I was talking in my, in my group about you know, the first Guardian article coming out, nineteen ninety two. I think was it. Is that right? Ninety seven. Ninety seven. Um, and it's sort of. I, I felt it around the LBC. Is it's sort of breaking a kind of culture. And many, many people, including quite senior order members, had quite a bit of a crisis of faith in Bante. So I wondered whether you ever had a crisis of faith in Bante. Cause, mm -hmm. And then I wonder whether we might start to talk about, well, what do you make of the... And, you know, one has to go there, I'm afraid. You, know, <laughs> you can hardly say the word Bante without saying, what do you make of them? I hope one day soon we can just stop doing that. Um, but, you know, let's go there, at least for a little while. But... You know, because they were, I found it quite difficult because a lot of the order members I looked up to mm. suddenly were really 
quite in crisis about mm. their relationship to Bante. Mm. I found it. I, I remember finding it very, very difficult. Uh, I remember, you know, trying to talk to Sabuti. Sabuti was critical of Bante. I talked to Bante, and he was critical of Sabuti. Um, it was like a, an argument between your parents. I had to go home. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can we cut that out? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <if> you, yeah. <laughs> um, well, the thing is. <laughs> Oh, how do you talk about this whole area? Um, but you, let's start with your... Have you, you've no, not, you know, the why thing, not, do you think? Well, you in, well the, in, look, <laughs> I, can't, I can't rub out Bunty's effect on me, mm. which is totally positive, more than positive, mm. powerfully spiritually transformative. You know, that can't be taken away. It, it, you know, it, sorry, people, I mean, what can I say? So I cannot be critical. Mm. I refuse to be critical. Mm. Um, I don't mind other people being critical if that's mm. their experience and so mm. on, fine. But sorry, I'm not going to join you. Mm. This man has transformed my life mm. and given me so much. Why am I going to be critical of that? I just feel nothing but gratitude and reverence and respect. My personal experience of bounty has been, um, you know, at times very challenging, very demanding, but totally in the context of utter kindness mm. and, and helpfulness and encouragement. Mm. Yeah. The other aspect, of course, you have to remember, I mean, look, I knew Bounty was sleeping with guys because guys told me. Mm. We all knew. You, we, you know, in those days, in the early days, I mean, friends of mine, it was almost like, well, why, am I, why isn't he doing it with me? You know, <laughs> am I sort of, am I, you know, am I not a proper disciple? You know what I mean? I mean, I would have probably freaked out. But, you know, you know, this sort of idea that it was sort of, you know, people sort of tend to read things like, oh, it's a big religious organisation. And the guy at the top was, you know, having it off with, with you know, all these blokes in secret it's rubbish. Mm. It's just not like that. Even when it I got was, involved, everybody knew. You know, yeah. and... and you know, people would tell me, oh, look, I'm going to say it as well. And again, this won't be popular, but f very good friends of mine, and these are very weighty older members taking a lot of responsibility. They said it was an incredible experience mm. and it changed their life because they experienced love very, very directly. Mm. And it sort of freed up all sorts of inhibitions. I mean, that story can't be told. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of those guys would want to talk about that because they'll just be shot down in flames. But that's the fact. Mm. That's the truth. Mm. You know, and, um, you know, I do think that there's, that, yeah, you can't sort of go there, really. But mm. for me, it's, 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 you know, I can't undo my very, very positive experience of Bante, you know, and, and I can't imagine anything that would come out that would affect that. Mm. Mm. You know, that, that he's my teacher. In a way, I do have a rather old-fashioned approach in, in some ways that, that you know, it's, it's a bit, you know, it's, I remember Prakasha saying in a group when we were talking about, you know, one of, another thing had appeared and, you know, repeating the same old stuff. And we were on a private preceptor's retreat and Prakasha just, you know, we were asked to talk about how do we feel about Bante with these preceptors. Mm. And Prakasha said, well, Bante's perfect. <laughs> and he's perfect. That's going too far. And well, he was taking the the tantric approach. He's mm. really into tantric mm. Buddhism. That Bhanti gave him the Dharma, the liberating Dharma. So he's perfect. Mm. Why would you question that? Why would you go into that? Now, I can sort of see his point of view. Mm. You know what I mean? I, and he's, you know, it's not. I'm not sure I would take it myself, but. Mm. In a sense, I do, right, yeah. because I'm not going to dwell on the faults of my teacher. You could do, mm. I could do. Mm. Milarepa says it. Milarepa says it to Richimpa when Richimpa's having a strop. Is that if you dwell on the faults of your teacher, you will see a million faults. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, if you dwell on one or two or three, you will see a mountain of faults. You know, what what are you going to give your attention to? Mm. You know, and uh, sooner or later, you have to decide, what am I going to give my attention to? And of course, sex is such a loaded issue for people. everybody got issues about sex. Mm. So it's particularly problematic. Mm. I mean, in some ways, I think it's quite good. 
because I hope it will put people off. <laughs> I mean, you know, in a sense. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? It, it's a way of finding out who's serious. Mm, okay. Yeah. You know, do you know what I mean? Mm. Look, what are you really into here? Mm. Well, and I'm not, look, I'm not, I'm neither am I saying that, you know, people who felt that they found it very difficult with Banti and, you know, all the rest of it. I'm not denying their experience either. And mm. that needs to be listened to mm. and talked about. Mm. Of course it does. And I wouldn't shut that down. Mm. But I have my experience mm. and I know mm. other people have their experience. Mm. So everybody's got their take on this one. Yeah, there isn't exactly. an official... And I don't like any mm. attempt to kind of have an official explanation mm. of what goes on. Mm. I really don't like that. People are going to have to sort of make up their own minds about what's valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I want to press you a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my job. Um, you know, you, you know, you saying earlier on, I won't be critical. I'm, I was struck by that. I won't be critical of Bounty. And that, as you say, it's very traditional, you know. Um, you could argue, or someone could argue, obviously not me. <laughs> <laughs> some fictitious person <laughs> could argue <laughs> um, that okay well you're a public preceptor um, you know you're very influential in our movement and order uh, therefore you sort of should be critical um, <laughs> you know just, just to mean that the concern could be if you wanted the concern to be is okay well you're you know you're an important figure here you ordain many people um, for that person we need you to have a, an unbiased that's a modern view, an unbiased, critical account which takes into account strengths and weaknesses that passes on an understanding of that. That could be a modern reading now, mm. which is a long, long way away from... So in other words, vision. I'm a public figure, not a human being. That would be the implication. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not... So that's I don't think I'd get very far with it before trying. <laughs> yeah. So in other words, I'm an institution, I'm not a person. You know, and, 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 and if people want me to be an institution, I'm sorry, I can't be an institution. I'm a mm. human being, I'm a person. And uh, as a public preceptor, I'm a person. Mm. You know, you can't be a public preceptor and receive people into the order without being a person with your own mm. individual take on things. And look, I don't expect my view to be an official view. Mm. This is me. And I do not expect anybody in this room or anywhere, anybody anywhere to have the same view of things as I do. You can't. Mm. It's, you have to make up your own minds about all this stuff, you know, about anything. You know, I really don't expect that. The, the, my feelings for Banti and my feelings for Banti, mm. they're completely independent of, of other people. This is one of the things I sort of, I sort of really hate about the movement being turned into a sort of religious, into a church. Mm. I absolutely can't stand it, you know. <laughs> it's so against what, what, we're, what we're really about. Mm. You know, in, in some ways I wish certain things would just sort of vanish. You know, and we could, you know, you know, it was just, I don't know, smaller, more intimate or something, because, you know, you end up having to have sort of positions and, mm. you know, acceptable positions. Well, sorry, I'm not going to do that. Mm. You know, and I also happen to think that people coming on going for refuge retreats are adults. Mm. They're, they're individual, mature human beings, and they can make up their own mind about things. Mm. Mm. I, I, I think you do get this sometimes with some older members, as if public preceptors are sort of leading a load of lemmings over the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is so insulting to, to the people coming into the movement. Mm, mm. You know, I mean, I meet a lot of people and, you know, especially these days, you know, I'm very, very struck by the maturity and, and agency, if you like, of, mm. of the people coming, you know, come, getting involved. You know, they've, they've had lives, they live lives. Mm. And, you know, they, they, they're pretty hard-headed in some cases. They're going to make up their own minds um, about it. You know, mm. so I can put my position. But the thing is, I do not expect people to have the same view as I do. I mm. really don't. And mm. nobody should be in any way forced to have feelings that they don't have. Mm. But I'm not going to pretend, you know, that mm. I'm something that I'm not. I'm mm. a devotional person. That's it. Mm. Take it or leave it. Mm. You know, if you... And if you find that difficult on going for refuge retreats, find out which going for refuge retreats I'm not on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Is and that you don't published? Have to up with it. 
I want to go back to that. Actually, I think there's something very profound about this, this issue of person, because I think one of the th things I see, a tendency in our order and movement, is even the ordination process could start to be thought of as a kind of ordination make, a order making factory yeah. where they go in at one end and come out as order yeah. and the public precept is a are in a way merely the end point of that process yeah. um, you know and you know protocols and mm. uh, and you know um, forms and you know here's what we would expect to be seeing at this point mm. as the order grows and the movement grows if it is growing which I'm, I'm actually not sure it is but it, let's say it is I'm actually not convinced but it might be the, the tendency could be to get more and more like that. And I think there's something that you're trying to bring in, which is, we're trying to emphasise, which is the, the ultimate value of person and, and it being between one person, like between Dardo and Bante, between Bante and Dardo, and then Bante, between Bante and you and you and others. Mm. Um, is well, there any way to sort of say more about it? Because I do think it's huh. actually weirdly countercultural now. Well, it was becoming so. You know. It's this whole thing that the, the order is nothing other than a network of friendships. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is even the word friendship in our movement can be devalued. Mm. But, but, you know, the only way you c I believe that you can, you know, all this stuff about lineage and transmission and all the rest of it, it can only happen within the atmosphere of, of intimate spiritual friendship. Mm. And, that, and that has to pervade, you know, your centres you know, your interactions with the order members locally, we want to generate that atmosphere here as much as possible and, mm. and, and see each other as much as we can as, mm. as people, not mm. as sort of pieces, what Bunty wants to call pieces of spiritual furniture. Mm. He said mm. that himself when he, before he took that sabbatical in Cornwall. He was tired of being treated as a piece of spiritual f furniture. There's one thing, again, that people, when they get, you know, hoity-toity about you know, Banty and, you know, all, all those different things. Well, hang on a minute. How, you know, how would you, you know, what would it be like to start a spiritual movement? Mm. And all people are doing are just loading their problems on you. And when you've helped them, they say bye-bye and they're off with somebody else. Mm. How do you feel about that? Mm. Mm. You know, what's it like to kind of be in that kind of relationship? Mm. You know, and, 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 you know, it's pretty demanding. You know, you get a bit of a taste of it just mm. as an order member. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, what we're looking for is something, yeah, far more to do with the person and far more to do with human communication and friendship. And it's only out of that that you can have the, the reverence mm. developing. And this is, I think Bhante is, one of the things Bhante's done is incredible. You know, he knows very, very well that you cannot impose guru-disciple relationship on our mm. world because mm. we're profoundly democratic mm. and egalitarian mm. um, but what you can encourage is friendships and out of friendships develops reverence you know when you know in a friendship if you discover that the other person is more experienced than you more developed than you yeah let's mm. say it mm. and naturally that will become respect and even reverence mm. that's the way he used to talk you can't mm. you know that you can't sort of impose these things it must come out of meta for mm. one another you know and and you know that's that's that must be where we where we go to every time i think mm. you know mm. in our communication with one another mm. i want to come back to reverence near, near the end because i think i want to come back to you know like for instance what somebody might feel if they don't feel that so but we'll come back to that in a minute i want to um go back to bante for a bit and mm. and, and explore you know your your developing relationship with Bante, you know, or, you know, after ordinary him coming here, you know, I remember meeting him here many times and mm. I remember us being on the, well, you were on the team for my Guki Loka and Bante was there at the same time and, and then seeing his, you know, his eyes go and all the, mm. think the difficult, I mean, terrible difficulties Bante had to endure. What happened with your friendship with Bante is, if well, that's the right word, there's no real word for it. I don't really. think there is a word for it. Friendship never feels quite right. But, yeah, I um, mean, I was the, uh, well, I mean, it's a bit of a story. Um, I presume we've got yeah, time. Yeah, we've got time, yeah. So, so I got ordained, it was a very, very vivid experience, you know, and, okay, I was 19, so very naive. Um, and I thought, right, that's it, you know, two years' time, do my 
sadhana every day doing the mantra and within two years the bodhicitta will arise <laughs> and I'll just be borne along by the bodhicitta gaining enlightenment for the benefit of all things I really thought that all sounds totally reasonable yeah. um, <laughs> and you know Bhante, Bhante's given me this practice and you know he said he'll give me the sadhana the written sheet and you know there's more initiations to come surely and then it just all went bad you know so I mean it came on I came on the mind in Buddhist psychology seminar that became know your mind oh, yeah, yeah. and he really wanted me on, to be on that yeah. and and that was one of the hardest periods of my life I mean because 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 I was in this state of well I basically wanted it's complicated right because Bhante was like an archetypal guru at my ordination naturally mm. not, not putting anything on he was mm. just was after when I sat down to do my sadhana I just saw him mm. you know just very vividly and I thought hang on it's supposed to be Papa Samba but it was him you know and quite mm. naturally mm. but then after that it sort of changed because what I'd done I'd appropriated it basically meaning I, I, I wanted him to be the guru thing for me uh -huh, yeah, who yeah. would be giving me teachings and I yeah. was going to be a special one mm. all that rubbish <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what I got from Bunty was um, Teflon I mean I'd go to you know in this sort of state I'd go to him and he'd sort of ignore me <laughs> 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 And um, try to get this sardine out of him. <laughs> Just, I was. It was. I mean, Trungpa Rinpoche talks about how you know the, the one of the ways in which the tantric guru works um, to the disciple is that they they sort of put out this sort of this sort of complete. How, how did he describe it? It's like a kind of almost like a black energy which not not sort of negative or nasty but mm. it's the complete opposite of egotism mm. it's kind of nothingness mm. and the and the disciple just doesn't know what's happening it was a bit like that with Bhante you know it's like <laughs> what the hell is going on you know I don't know what's happening here and of course over time I realized and um you know, I, 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 was, I was wanting, I was treating him as a piece of spiritual furniture. Mm. And he wasn't going to have that. Mm. And, he, and the thing is, he didn't explain that to me. Like, mm. these days, everything gets explained, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, well, I'm being like this to you, because you're like that. <laughs> and of course, you don't learn anything through that. You don't learn a thing. You just have a load of ideas. And, and get, it all gets very complicated. Actually, I learned something. No. You, you, you know, spiritual life isn't like this. I had to work that out. In India, when he came to India, I was determined, I realised I had to be different. And part of the difficulty was I was in awe of Bhante. So in a sense, I didn't know how to communicate with Bhante. You know, mm. I'd read about how you are with Tibetan lamas, but mm. Mm. he's not a Tibetan lama, he's mm. Bhante. Mm. In India, when he came on that first visit, which was one of the most incredible experiences of my life, I'm not going to do that thing with him mm. that I do. It doesn't work. Mm. And fortunately, I could be his attendant, which meant literally washing his clothes, making his tea, typing his letters, gathering up the garlands after these lectures, mm. putting his sandals on his feet. I was as happy as Larry. I was just mm. so happy. Uh, because that seemed to be the best way to communicate with my teacher. And, and in some ways, that I wish I could be, live, live, lived a life like that. Mm. You know, the, in some ways, all the responsibilities I had, I've, I've, I've inherited, which I haven't sought, in some ways I feel in the wrong place. Mm. Um, it's quite emotional in a way. I'd much rather... You know, be with my teacher and just serve him in that mm. very, very ordinary way. You know, that, that seems so much more meaningful, really. Yeah, it did. Um, anyway, um, I worked out, I've got to treat Bounty as a person. And, you know, I came back to Croydon, which, and there were all sorts of complications living in Croydon, um, which we won't go into. But one of the things that did happen during that period was that, I did have a lot of contact with Bhante. I was the Mitra convener, and 
I came on this seminar, the Siegel of Ardesutta seminar, and he, and we do, he'd also done the case of dysentery and this whole thing of treating people as people and not as things, mm. and and you know that was really really strong. Even though I was very compromised in the way I was behaving in Croydon at that time, there was something very attractive about treating people as people. I thought, why don't you treat Bhante as a person? Mm. rather than this guru thing who's supposed to give you everything that you want and then you judge him if he doesn't. Mm. Mm. So I started to give him presents. I'd find you know, books he might be interested in, second-hand books, bookshops, books on Blake and mm. John Middleton Murray and poetry books. And, and I just went out of my... And when I went to see him, I'd ask him about how he was. Mm. Mm. And, of course... Then he became a much more a much more interesting person. Mm. So forgetting about what I wanted and needed, mm. who am I with, and really trying to sort of ponder that. So that that really shifted things mm. and and getting away from this whole thing, because this is part of the problem in in people in people judging public figures. Again, you're not seeing them as a person mm. in their totality. Mm with all their sort of, you know, their history and complexities and, mm. and so on, and, and richness, mm. uh, you, you, you know, incredible sort of richness. So that, that was very, very important for me. Mm. And I remember going to see him when he was in Birmingham, and he was in a very bad way. He hadn't been mm. sleeping, mm. his eyes had gone, and I was asked to sit with him because there was no, <coughs> he needed people to sit with him. Mm. So I was you know, asked, asked to go and sit with him. So they're going to sit with Bunty and he's sitting there looking absolutely exhausted. Mm. And he was clearly concerned about how I would view him. Mm. He said something like, it must be a bit strange for people to see me like this. Mm. And I said, Bunty, look, I really don't mind how you are. And mm. I really didn't. Mm. You know, I'd not long been with my father, who was a very old man and... Mm not very well I said I, you can be I, yeah, you can be however you are and and I said the thing is Banty people think that, that you should be invincible and he said well I still am <laughs> <laughs> I still am and I said oh I said, I said well, it is quite interesting being with you because I can see that you're really suffering but there is still this gravitas I can't remember the word I used this mm. And he said, well, it is very strange, he said, because I do feel, I really am suffering, but I also feel happy at the same time. Mm. And um, it was a very poignant meeting, you know, and, and, and you know, it's like, I, I didn't need Vanti, I suppose, to be, like I say, invincible, though he still was. Mm. Yeah. And I think the very last meeting, I don't know if it was the very last, but it was very near the end, was... At Adistana, again, very, very old. Um, and, you know, he, we, we did this Guru Yoga retreat. Um, and I asked him if he would um, bless uh, a ball of thread that I, we would give at the end of the retreat mm. for everybody on the retreat while I recited the Guru Yoga liturgy. He said, as long as it doesn't take too long. <laughs> I said, no, I'll do it quickly. Um, so he held, the, so I, I chanted this liturgy and he went into meditation, finished it, and I thought, he's not coming out. Mm. He was really absorbed. Mm. And, um, you know, very, you know, frail and absorbed. And, um, and then he handed the thread to me. He said, I'm thinking of Blake. I give to you a a golden thread or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. you go in at eternity or something. And, and I felt that, in a way, perhaps in that moment, there was a kind of coming together of, of this very frail old man and yet in touch with these profound depths of the Dharma. Mm. And he was very happy to, on that retreat. He, was, he kept saying, I'm so pleased you're doing this retreat. Mm. I'm so happy this is happening and people were going in to see him and, and some of the people who are looking after Bhante saying, what, what has happened to Bhante? Mm. He's so different with people. Mm. 
because mm. he was chanting and blessing them and mm. he really was being in, in, in that kind of mode. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, well. Let's start to wind up this part of it, but I want to... I do want to say something about with loyalty to my teachers, oh, yes, just to yeah, remind no, you. We'll keep going, we'll go, I've got yes. some things to say about yes, that. Yes, we want to go to that. So, yeah, that's where we'll go, I think. Because, <laughs> um, you know, here we are, you know, on the, the, nearing the end of a retreat on, in, uh, on what is the order. Um, what do you, you know... Ordination seems to me to be the most sacred, well, it's the most sacred event in my life. It might change, completely change my life. I was ordained by Sivadra on the course, at, privately ordained by Sivadra on the course that you were on the team and Sabuti publicly. It seems to me the most serious thing you can do um, in, the, in the proper sense. What, what, what would you say to people about their relationship to Bante in that? and to their private and public preceptors in relationship to that. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll wind into that by, by talking about the phrase with loyalty to my yeah, teachers. Yeah, yeah. Um, because when I started to do public ordinations, um, you know, you start seeing the ordi- ordination ceremony rather differently. Mm. Um, and I was very struck by the four acceptance verses. And Bhante was here. Um, I figure, and I, I said, could, could, you, could you tell me about the acceptance verses? Because he composed them. Mm. You know, the, the ordination ceremony. And it's just worth acknowledging, you know, that the ordination ceremony is, it's based on a traditional Upasaka ordination ceremony, but it's Bhante's ordination ceremony. So it is a good idea to make up your mind about Bhante because this is the, the actual ceremony you will undergo both privately and publicly, is his expression of, mm. ordina- of what an ordination ceremony is. It's mm. all coming from him. So I think that's, mm. it's not, you know, you don't get it off the internet or out mm. of thin air. You know, mm. this comes mm. through his transmission. You know, it's, it's, it's his lineage very, mm. very directly. Mm. Uh, but anyway, I, I asked him about the four verses and he said... Um, he, he, he talked mostly about the first one. And the first thing he said was, notice loyalty to, not faith in. Yeah. And uh, and then he said by loyalty, he meant something really strong, almost feudal mm. in its strength. Mm. But loyalty to, not faith in. And I went away and reflected on that. Or maybe we talked about it. I can't quite remember. Faith is for the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Mm. I think this is really important. Shraddha is always explained as your response, your resonance with the three jewels. And, you, and, and the expression of that is going for refuge. So he's not saying that you have faith in your teachers. Mm. And he said, it's good that I wrote teachers, plural, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> because it means it refers particularly to the private and public preceptor. That's mm. the way he explained it. Mm. Um, and he was saying, well, you know, the person who ordains you, you would have a very, very strong bond with them. That's his vision of ordination. Mm. It's really strong because they're the people who witness your faith. Mm. You're going for refuge in, in, in the three jewels. But I think that's quite an important distinction, yeah, it is, yeah. you know, because it, 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 and, it, and it's and it's he doesn't mean by that blind loyalty, mm. not at all. Um, it's not that you you, you you can't question or you wouldn't question or you or, or, or even criticize. I've certainly been questioned and criticized by people I've ordained, you know, perfectly except and, and actually they were right. Mm. Mm. You know, it's, so, so I think this is very, very important to understand. Um, I think another thing that is that I'd like to bring in here is, um, well, maybe I'll mention it in a minute. Is there anything you want to follow up from what I just said there? But there is a particular... Yeah, carry on for a bit, I think. Well, yeah. there's this very important teaching called the Pratisaranas. Mm. Pratisaranas, the, the, the reliances, the four great reliances, mm. which Bhante expounds in the last lecture from the Vimalakirti Nidesha series. And the first of the Pratisharanas, the reliances, rely on the Dharma, not on any person. Mm. Rely on the Dharma and not on any person. 
And Bunty goes into this masterfully. He said, well, look, you, you be careful how you, you approach this because you can't have the Dharma without people mm. because the Dharma comes from people. You know, if you, it, it's not in thin air. You know, as he said, there's no such thing as enlightenment. There are only enlightened persons. Mm. There's no such thing as Buddhism. There are only Buddhists. Mm. Uh, the Dharma is transmitted by people. It's a communication. So he clarifies it that you rely on, you rely on, you can rely on the person to the extent mm. that the Dharma is alive in their life. Mm. To the so I think that's again a very important clarification. Mm. You know, so the, the extent that the Dharma is alive and transmitting and embodied in a sense in the person you rely on that mm. but not in all the sort of different aspects of mm. their behavior mm. you know and, and and you know you know perhaps that's a way of relating to Bhante mm. you know that that you know if people have sort of difficulties well you know you rely on him as a communicator and transmitter of the Dharma it doesn't mean that you have to kind of follow all the sort of different you know, bits and pieces of his character. You can't do that, you know. And, and No, well, you yeah. can't separate it too much either. But you can't separate it either. That's yeah. also true. Because yeah. Yeah. some people yeah. want to say, well, I'm happy with Bante's teachings. Yeah. I'm just not happy with him. Yeah, but then that's problematic because, you, you know, which bit are you not happy with him? Mm. You know, you're going to dismiss, you know, how many of us, for example, I've been thinking a bit about Bante's life lately, how many of us could, you know, burn all our clothes Throw, burn up our passport, you know, wear some discoloured white cloth and wander around India, homeless, mm. uh, searching for the Dharma. How many people have done that? Mm. I don't know anybody in the order who's lived like that. Mm. How many people could, could, could work with, with ex, so-called ex-untouchable Buddhists? I, you know, I never forget Dada said Rupawate, a, a Buddhist politician, who came to see us, he was very, very involved in, in Maharashtra and even national politics, you know, in and out of being part of Indira Gandhi's Congress party. And he was an old disciple of Bhante. And Dada said, came to see me, came to see me in Lokomitra, and he was in tears, mm -hmm. talking about Bhante coming to Ahmednagar district, where he was from, after the first conversions. And he said, we've never seen anybody like this. He would eat any food, drink any water, sleep anywhere, walk for miles from house to house, stay up late at night talking to people about the Dharma, mm. helping them to practice and understand the Dharma. Well, Bhante lived like that. How many people do that? Mm. How mm. many people have lived like that? How many people could start, you know, a new Buddhist movement in 1960s London? You know, mm. Or even just read the stuff when he came back from India, when he was in the Hampstead Vihara, travelling all over Britain, Mm -hmm. giving Dharma talks, these tiny Buddhist groups, mm. tirelessly. How many people could do that? Mm. You know, so, okay, you can might say, well, I don't like, which bit of Bhante are you going to reject? Mm. Mm. And how many people could actually live that kind of life? I mean, for me, Bhante has exemplified the Bodhisattva ideal. Mm. You know, he has. You know, he's, he's, he's lived a life devoted to other people mm. uh, and communicating the Dharma uh, to them. Mm. Uh, so I think you know you you do need to do if you're going to go into Bhante you really got to do a bit of research mm. and really look at everything if you, if you're going to look at everything mm. yeah yeah and what what we th I think we might do in just a moment is open up to some questions mm. um, I was going to have a tea break I don't think we've got quite got time um, I, but I, I thought I would finish this this part by you know. Um, What, what, what would you say to these guys, you know, in terms of ordination? What, what do they need to do? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're all so different, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you need to do? Well, I think, the, you know, perhaps, the, you know, the first, the first thing that occurs to me is that, that um, ordination is... is it, it, it comes about because of the the effectiveness of your going for refuge and effective is is of course used in a very special sense yeah. it's it's not you know because i'm sure you're going for refuge is having effects 
now, but it's capital E, if you like. Vanti said when he talked about these levels of going for refuge, in some ways the nomenclature wasn't quite right. Mm. And the first time he talked about it, when he talked about effective going for refuge, he talked about it in terms of, from Tantric Buddhism, the esoteric refugees, the Guru, mm. the Yidam, the Darkani. But what he was particularly concerned to get at was that the refugees have entered into your experience. Mm. Yes, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, in all their profundity and sublimity, but they need to be activated in your life. Mm. And that will include, that has to include, being part of an intimate spiritual community. So it's for, for them to be activated <coughs> with, with a very definite stream of, 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 well, let's call it lineage. Mm. Otherwise, it just won't be activated. It'll just be in, 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 in the air, so to speak. It won't be really sort of grounded. It won't be real. You know, it's, it's got to be tangible and, and alive. And in a sense, you have to be answerable to other people. Mm. You know, the whole thing about it being witnessed, that means that you're being seen. Um, you know, in, in all your sort of different aspects, everything has got to come to the party. Mm. Everything has got to be seen, you know, like, you, you, you know, Bounty's saying in the tantric um, spiritual community, everybody is naked. Mm. Everybody is, is, is showing everything, both their sort of their heights and their depths. You know, the, if you like, the sublime and the sordid, it's mm. all sort of seen in its mm. totality. So that's the first thing. If you're going to effectively go for refuge, you've got to bring everything in. And not pretend. Don't put on a going for refuge show for us. Mm. You know that that's terrible. You know you, you you know we we won't be able to see where you're at. We need to see everything. I think another big feature of going for refuge is taking individual responsibility for your life. I mean, the private ordination is very very strong in that respect. This symbolism of you're prepared to go alone, mm. even if nobody else is going. And so the sort of essence of a dharmachari's life must be taking individual responsibility. So any, any attempt to kind of blame other people for your problems, blame the movement, blame the order, blame Bante, is a complete breaking of the going for refuge, in my view. Mm. You know, I'm not saying you can't criticise, but you have to take responsibility for yourself. Mm. You know, I have done this. I do this. This is my life. And, and if you're doubtful about, you know, going for refuge within the context of the order, don't do it. Mm. You can say, oh, look, I need to take a break. I need to explore other things. You know, or, 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 or leave no stone unturned in terms of your exploration of things. So they're, they're the things that I would mention right now as mm. we're on this, yeah. on this topic. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's really great. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank yeah. you very much, Pamela. Yeah. Let's finish there just for now. So, thank you. I thought we could have just 20 minutes just now of any questions that you might have uh, to Pablo Vadra uh, about anything he said or indeed about anything, you know, like ma medieval marquetry or something. <laughs> sure he knows about What's that? <laughs> um, yeah, just so I thought we'd have a, you know, just a 20 minute period now and then we'll have a bit more of a break before lunch. So, yeah. Just uh, on the ordination, you, know, you said like when you yourself got ordained, you felt like it was burnt almost by it. I just wondered how you felt on the other end of that as a uh, as a private preceptor and the public preceptor, the, the sort of feelings that you experience in that position. Mm. Oh, the, I think the main feeling of of with 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 both the ordinations was was an il enormous sense of privilege and a, a, a great honour to be able to ordain people. Um, I mean, the, the, there's a different sort of flavour to to the private and public ordination. The, you know, with the private ordination, in in a way that there's not much I can say because, you you know, you your my memory of doing well, I don't have memories of doing private ordination. Sorry, people, I've ordained um, <laughs> because you're so in the moment. Mm. You know, if I I took it seriously, well, if I'm to witness what's going on, I need to be completely focused. 
you know, and, 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 and completely involved in going for refuge myself. So in a, in a sense, that's all I, all I was concerned with. With, with the public ordination, I, I suppose one of the, the, the things about that was this sense of what you're, you're bringing people, you're, you're aware of a vast network of trust because that ordination stands everywhere throughout the Tree Ratna world, which is quite a thing to say, actually. So, you know, in India, in Australia, in the United States, throughout Britain, people would, nobody has ever questioned a public ordination that I've done or my friends have done um, which is quite a you know that's an incredible sort of network of trust mm. and you're very very conscious of that I think of, of, of and, and again it's a great honour to be able to serve the order in that way um, you know so, so that, that they're, they're the sort of feelings and of course you, you also become conscious of you know, you have a great responsibility to the people that you've ordained. And, and you know, when I was first a public preceptor um, going to, to, to college meetings, and there weren't so many of us in those days, I mean, Sabuti was really exploring this mm -hmm. by looking at, you know, the, the Bodhisattva precepts that Dada Rinpoche gave to Bounty, the traditional set of precepts and so on, because they're all about the ethics of impact, if you like, when, when you do have a particular responsibility. So I think they're the sort of the feelings. And of course, tremendous joy. I mean, you know, at seeing somebody emerging mm. in front of you. And there was always that sense of, you know, a before and after, you know, that incredible sort of moment when you see a room filled with cases. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's this, you know, like lotuses unfolding, you know, definitely. Mm. And there's great, great joy in that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, Pablo Vajra. Um, yeah, just like a few words going on, like uh, faith is for going for refuge. Um, and, you know, there's you know, like words like imagination that go with faith and, and then devotion. Um, we've also talked about critical mind and you need that critical mind. And I feel like when, like personally, if I feel like faith is flowing, devotion is flowing, the spiritual life is very easy. Um, but then I don't know where the critical mind fits in when mm. I'm in that space. Mm. And it feels like, where, where does it all fit in? Because mm. it feels like when I've got this critical mind on, suddenly the spiritual life doesn't feel easy. Right. Um, so how, how, how does that work? If we've got, we're trying to develop this faith yeah. and go for refuge more and more. Well, in a, in a way, mm -hmm. perhaps you could look at the critical mind being developed and being refined. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say that's also an aspect of faith. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't say it, the tradition says it, you know, that, that you get this trusting shraddha or the, or the, or the, the shraddha that's, that's a very deep conviction. And that comes through reflecting on the doctrine you know, you really, really do your Dharma study and you really reflect upon the Four Noble Truths and Pratitya Samatpada and, you know, the great truths of, and karma and its effects, but you, you really scrutinise it. Um, you know, you, you, you don't just take it on faith. Mm -hmm. You really investigate it, uh, think about it. Does it sort of add up? Does it, does it make sense? Is that actually going on in my experience? So there is, as part of faith, I think there is such a thing as a, as a sort of dharmic, critical thinking, you know, mm. chintamaya pragna, if you like, mm. where you're really investigating uh, the dharma. And of course, that's going to affect all aspects of your experience. Do you see what I mean? So, you know, perhaps with, with, with it's not critical mind bad, mm faith good it's more because we have got minds which analyze and we sort of think hang on that doesn't add up or mm. we do have reason mm. and and so on but you you employ that in your search for truth if you see what i mean and in the end and sometimes there might be this wonderful coming together of the emotional response and the the critical if you like or the investigatory response yeah because faith really in its fullness it, it you know includes and transcends if you like the the emotional 
the, 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 the cognitive or the intellectual or the rational and the volitional. It has all, all of that in it. Yeah. So, you know, it can be, it might be, Matt, if, if this is an issue for you, maybe you need to employ your critical mind more in really questioning the Dharma, mm. you know, and, and what it really means. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Great, thank you. At one point, sorry. I thought of yeah, at one point uh, we were talking about loyalty. You you mentioned medieval loyalty, um, mm. and I wonder if you say a bit more about that. Well, it, it was more that I think it, he, he used the word feudal. Mm. feudal yeah, mm. feudal, which yeah. I suppose is medieval, wasn't mm. it? I think it was the strength of the bond he was wanting to get at rather than we should go back to feudal times where we're sort of <laughs> doffing our caps. It, it was the sort of strength, I think, of, of response that he was particularly concerned with. And, and um, you know, you, you, it's a very old-fashioned word, loyalty, isn't it? And it can be problematic. And he certainly wasn't encouraging blind loyalty, but definitely being able to sort of stand if you like, beside the, 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 the people that, that, that mean the most to you, perhaps even when they're being criticised. Mm. You know, this is very, you know, you get this in descriptions of, of in all the traditions, East or West, that talk about friendship and brotherhood. They, they really emphasise um, standing up for your friend's good reputation in public when they're being criticised. Because, of course, in those times, reputation was everything. That was your social security. Mm. And if somebody was being, their, their character was being destroyed in public, well, that would be the end. So friendship, a big part of traditional friendship, was standing by your brother, standing by your friend in public when they are being criticised. I mean, we've sort of lost sight of mm. that mm. sort of thing. And I mean, Al Ghazali is particularly strong. Is you never ever criticise your your brother, especially not in public. Mm. Only if it's threatening the friendship. You never do that. You concentrate always on his virtue mm. uh, and praising his virtue. You know, to keep bringing out the best because he knows only too well that if we concentrate on the negative in other people, it just increases and increases and, and increases. But it's that strength of Faithfulness. I mean, he gave that lecture, Banti, fidelity, or as he pronounced it, fidelity. <laughs> um, that's such a, an important um, quality, you know. Thank you. Um, I have a question about you know cultivating a, I mean, like a relationship with Banti. You know, never never met Banti, and um, you know, I guess I try and get a sense from, from you know hearing people like you who knew him quite intimately talking about him, you know, much about his impressions that <laughs> you know, he was doing, reading Banta, you know, obviously very grateful for the mm. movement he set up. I was wondering if, like, you know, I was just struck by how moved you were, like, at, you know, the prospect of a life not lived, of being Bante's attendant and, you know, that being the outcome of, like, your relationship over, like, decades. And just wondering if, like, Bante is going to more move to a kind of like mythic level in a way of like, you know, that hmm. response you had, I wonder if you'd have had that if you hadn't met him and, oh, you know, right. I was yeah. imagining like 50 years time, say, when there's not even people who knew Bante that yeah. well. And, yeah. You know, I bring, it kind of, yeah, it just seems like it's hard to have, so I can feel as if I can be loyal to Bante, but, you know, the reaction you had felt more like, I don't know, like devotion, emotional devotion, not just mm. loyalty to your teachers. Mm. So like, you know, is he going to move to a kind of more mythic, Level it's very hard to level. say, I think. I mean, already, mm. I think, I mean, people dream about Bante and even people who've never met him. Mm. You know, I know people who, who, who've not met Bante and their, and their response is incredibly strong. And I think there's a number of fact. you know, it's partly individual, personally, you know, you, you, ha you have to take into account individual temperaments and, mm. and these things can't be forced. Uh, they really can't. Otherwise, you end up with something cultish and we really don't want that. Um, I think you, funnily enough, I think if you're just involved in the Sangha and you have spiritual friendship with, with order members, you know, perhaps especially if they've got a strong feeling for Bante, you are, you are developing a relationship with Bante, mm -hmm. even without being conscious of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, think he, I think he's sort of there. You know, I think in a sense, he's here. 
mm. you know, um, sort of thing. Um, and I, I get, I've got this horrible feeling if he turned up and said, really? You know, <laughs> it could be a bit like that. But, you know, so I think actually you, you could even say that, that studying his teachings, practicing the, the, the meditations he's transmitted, that in many ways is the best way to get to know your teacher. Mm. You know, the, the, you know, you, you know you, so it comes through actually practicing the Dharma, because that's what he wanted people to do. Mm. He wanted people to practice the Dharma and develop as individuals. Mm. You know, that, that's his great, you know, that's what he wanted. It's not a kind of cult of personality or something like that. And, um, but, and, and, you know, he, it's also why he wrote all the memoirs and the poetry and all that and, br and got it out there so that people could develop a more of a sort of connection uh, with him. And then I think you just have to sort of let it happen, as it were. Um, but I feel very connected with Bhante, I should just say, when I, when I listen to his lectures or read transcripts of his lectures, I feel really in touch with him in ways that, in a different way from the sort of personal connections I've had with him. Um, in some ways, it's more, it's even deeper because it's the Dharma. I remember once we were in a seminar with him in the retreat centre lounge, and we were asking all these personal questions about his meditation practice and all that sort of thing. And at a certain point, I am beginning to wonder why you want to know all about this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he was more or less saying, look, it's the teachings that are important. Mm. It's, it's, it's the Dharma that, that, that's important, you know, here. Um, Although we were all, you know, it was he did sort of open up a bit about mm. things. Yeah, mm. yeah. I don't. Think I've answered that for you, Danny. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. So we've got time, I think, for one more. Yeah, Andrew. Well, I was connected with this, but I was uh, struck by you describing Bante coming and sitting by the steep right there, but now we've got Bante's burial mound, yeah. whatever it's called, at Adastana, and I wonder whether you've got. Um, any suggestions about how we can have some kind of re relationship with Bhante through through that, and even mm. the sense of Bhante's Adhisthana? Mm. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I found it very moving, particularly sitting in his room. Mm. You know, which you can go and sit. I think you can go and sit in. And I had to. I kept falling asleep in there and having sort of strange meditative dreams uh, in there. I particularly enjoyed that. I think all you can do is is go there and, I, I mean, when I go to Adistan, I mean, every morning I, I go and circumambulate and offer incense and I feel very close to Bounty in a different way. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do have a sense of that, Adistan, but of course I've had a personal relationship with with him i mean of course if we were in a traditional <laughs> culture again it would it just be what people did the, you know they'd arrive at adistana they'd get out of their cars or their taxis first thing they would do they'd go and worship hmm. like jampal calden and his wife mrs calden they they came to papaloka they were visiting britain and we invited them up for the day to see Rinpoche stupa because I think we're the only people who had a stupa. In those days, it was all gravel mm. around the stupa. Mm. We did, hadn't tiled it. But as soon as they saw the stupa, they knelt, they prostrated in the gravel, you know, and they did a guru puja immediately to the stupa. Mm. Immediately, before anything else. That's what they did. That was, it's, it's what you do, you know, in, 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 that, in that world, in that society we have to sort of arrange it, don't we? And kind of, mm. you know, okay, before the puja, we'll, everybody be a nice idea, if, <laughs> perhaps, maybe. <laughs> and you, you know, and it, wouldn't it be great, though, if, if there was this immediate sense, there's, there's the chaitya of our teacher, there's the, the, the burial mound of, of, of uh, you know, the great hero, let's, let's, go and, let's go and worship, let's go and do that, you know, and, you know, and, and see what happens. And that's that's you know that's what I'd like to see happening. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So perhaps we'll wind up there. Just 
It, I, I, want, I wanted to go back to that, and I was very struck by your story of Bounty sitting on that bench and looking at the stoop, and it feels like having you here is, you know, we're looking at you looking at Bounty, uh, and that seems to me to be lineage as much as anything in the world is. Um, so I just wanted to thank, finish by thanking you for today, obviously, but, yeah, just for all you've given me personally, but also all you've given us, all you've given the order and the movement since you were 18 or whatever it was, <coughs> since you, th those days. And especially I wanted to thank you for giving us Bante, really. Um, showing us Bante. You know, so that we can gaze through you at Bante and Bante can gaze at the stupa and Dardo is gazing at the Buddha. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>